she has said we are beginning on a new series. Today it will be a six week long series and we have themed it as he has said, she has said, this is our God. Because we want to get into the, to talk about the attributes of God. Every week we got into one character of God and expound on it fully and, and you know, walk this journey of knowing our God better. Why? Because, I don't know if you know this, but the way you live your life betrays what you know or think about God. I don't know if you have ever thought about it that way. Be for example, if you are a person who really believes in the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge of everything that happens in the world, there is a likelihood that you live life less anxiously or that you are more accepting of the things that happen in your life. Now, some of us only believe in the sovereignty of God and have been a bit afraid of God because of it. You know what I mean? He, I mean, he'll do what he wants, so you are maybe even fatalistic and things like that. Some of us believe in the sovereignty of God, but have also added on top of that the goodness of God. And so you are likely the kind of person who will say, even if this thing is happening in my life and I don't know why it is and it's painful to me, I know that God is good and I know at the end I will see why God is doing what he is doing. So you have a likelihood of, you are the people who will say, I know everything happens for a reason and I know it is a good reason, yeah? Why? Because you believe in the goodness of God. If you are the kind of person who believes, uh, say, in the fact that God is judge, that God is a righteous judge, you are likely a person who is very afraid of sin. Be and you're afraid of treating people unjustly because you have a conviction at the back of your head that at some point, God will pursue you for justice. But if you don't really think of God as a judge, you likely, you know, just do things and move on with life and say, see, God understands, you know life, you know? But what is, it is betraying is what you know about God, yeah? If you believe in God to be a provider, you're likely to run to God first when you're in need not all other things, and then when all has failed, then you say, hey, you know, sasa ni mungu amebaki, watch, let me go and now ask for help from God, yeah? So how you live your life reflects what you know or believe about God. I, and so my, my prayer is that in this series, it will be, you will be reflective. You will unpack your heart. You will find out what it is you know about God, what you believe about God. For some of you, there will be new things that will be shared here on this pulpit. For some of you, it will be a reminder of things that you, have, you already know, or maybe a clarification of some attributes you've always known but haven't really understood over time. And my, but though my prayer is at the end of the, usually, you know, I like to say, I know that you don't always remember all the sermons preached on this pulpit, do you? Hardly, isn't it? However, the sermons that are preached are geared towards your understanding of the character of God. And so at the end of the year, at the end of six months, I don't know how you live your life, but if you find that at the end of the year there is something else you think about God or something different you feel about God, it is likely that you have been listening and being changed by the word of God, and therefore there is an effect, even though you, you don't remember all the sermons to the details. Do you understand what I mean? And so my hope is at the end of this um, sermon series, the six-part uh, series, and also in addition to all the sermons that are preached here about God, you will take stock of your life every so often and ask yourself, what do I now think about God? What do I, do I know about God? How does my life reflect what it is I believe about God? Now, in the first service, I was, con oh, let me introduce myself first, I, and I forgot to do this in the first service as well. My name is Lorraine, as Pastor Charity has said. I serve as one of the pastors in this congregation. I am a youth pastor, which is why I cheered for Pastor Thomas. <laughs> I am the youth pastor, yes, oh, pastor. Thank you, Njeri, she confused me. I'm the youth pastor in this church. I serve with Pastor David and Pastor Konari. Uh, I am married to one gentleman. His name is Dennis Bundi. I see him over there. And together we have a baby. He's, uh, I don't know, with Pastor Madenge somewhere uh, in the fields. He's only two years old. I really thank God for these two men, one and a half men in my life. <laughs> All right. Um, I was going to say that in the first service, I was convinced that we learned from CRE that there are incommunicable characters of God and communicable characters of God. But the first service refused and said we, they never learned anything like that in CRG. And so later on, during the review, the pastor told me what we learned was diseases, communicable and incommunicable diseases. <laughs> 
Yeah? But based on that knowledge, which I can assume also for you, you know it from biology, not from, from CRE, God also has attributes that are incommunicable and communicable attributes, yeah? The incommunicable attributes of God are the ones that you cannot share in as a human. Only God has those attributes. And so because of that, we, we describe him as holy other, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, holy other, set apart, and therefore exalted as God. Yeah, because these attributes, like you know, him being a creator, he creates. You cannot create anything. He is omnipresent. He can be everywhere. Every he is everywhere at all times, at through history. But we cannot be like that. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. Those are some of the character attributes, and there are many more. Which is why we call you guys to Nawiri to sign up for Nawiri, because in Nawiri you get to go deeper into all all these things. So those are the incommunicable characters of God. And then there are communicable attributes of God. And these are the things that we can share in as uh, humanity. These are things like God's justice and God's mercy, God's love. You have the ability to be loving, isn't it? You have the ability, at least married people, you have had the ability to be loving. What were I life? <laughs> I like to take this chance to do this because Jasmine is always making fun of married people. Uh, you can be merciful. You're able to be, to be just in your dealings. So those are the, the, the morality. We can share in the morality of God because in those things, then his, the image and the likeness of the Son of God shows itself in us in those communicable attributes of God. And so in this six-part series, I'm going to, we are going to, um, I'm going to do two of them today and, and next week, and then after that we're going to get, we will start with the incommunicable characters of God and then the communicable attributes of God. So stick around for this and go to your real groups for this because this is going to spark a lot of conversations and debate and discussions as we try to, to understand. We cannot sound the depths of who God is, but we will try because whereas we might not know him fully, we can know him truly, and that can affect how, how we live our lives, all right? And so, quotable quotes. Ha, we have just started. <laughs> All right, ah, yeah. so today I want to get into the first, uh, not that it's first in the listing, there's no first in that listing, but today I'm going to get into an incommunicable attribute of God, which is his omniscience. All right, omniscience. And the definition of omniscience, as you probably know, is that God is all knowing. Yeah? God is all knowing. And the, this is described as, let me try to describe it in my words, it's that he knows everything about everything across all time. Everything about everything, in its intimateness, comprehensiveness, everything about everything across all time. Because God, you realize God created time, yeah? In the, in the beginning, God, he was already there, but he, there's a point in which time started because he created it, and he stands outside of time. So he knows everything at the same time, including the time of hell. You know how some people struggle with if God is loving, how can he uh, put people to hell? Which is a discussion for Nawiri, not for this pulpit here today. But he knows even that. He sees it because he's standing outside of time. He sees, you know, Alpha and Omega when we sing such, such songs. Sorry. And so a pastor has put it across this way, someone who, a pastor who wrote a book. He said, he knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters, all causes, all thoughts, all feelings, all desires, all personalities, everything visible and invisible across space and across spiritual dimensions. Everything about everything. Why does God know everything about everything across all time? Because he created all things. I was speaking to my husband about this earlier today. My husband is a software developer. And I asked him, when you, uh, when you, when you create an app, and you have written code for it, back end, front end, all these things. If something breaks in that code and therefore the app isn't working the way it, it does, would you know, do you know how it, you know everything about everything about that thing you created? He said, yes. I mean, of course, as human, you'll have to go back and look through the code to see where he put a wrong English word or something. I don't know exactly how those things work. The <laughs> software developers know. But he can go into his creation and do what needs to be done about it. And the reason he knows it comprehensively is because he is the one who created that code, yeah? And so this is why God knows everything about everything across all time because he created everything. We use this uh, term, 
I think, I don't know if it's Latin or Greek, the theologians here who are in school will tell me, when we use the word ex nihilo, that God created everything out of nothing. He spoke and out of nothing, things came into being, yeah? There were, so because he is described as the creator of all things, therefore he knows things, everything, about everything, in all its depth, in all its expanse, everything. I know you understand what I mean now. I want us to go to Psalm 139 because David tries in as, as best as human words can capture to describe this knowledge of God about his creation. So Psalm 139. Psalm 139, I hope the media team uh, will put it up on the screen for us. David says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my, my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I, I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. And so David tries to describe the expanse and the intimateness of the knowledge that God has of him. And as I was reading through it, I thought to myself, in fact, all creation should be able to say what David has, has said. Not just humans, but trees should be able to say, God, you know me. You, for, before I was a seedling, before you knew how I was formed from before the beginning of time, from before that seed dropped somewhere and became at the tree that it is now. The, the fish in the sea should be able to say that, that God knows it as intimately as David is trying to describe here. The stars in the sky, the ones that we have sung about here that God has created, should be able to say these same words that David is sharing here. Why? Because all creation is, should, should be able to, to share in the knowledge of, the, of how much, how intricately, how in, deeply, I'm trying to look for human words to describe how much God knows each and every creation. So all creation should be able to say to, should be able to say that. Another thing that David makes a case for is that God does not need senses to gain information, unlike we humans do. Reference verse in the same Psalm 139, verse 11 and 12. David says, "If I say, surely the darkness will hide me." and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Let me tell you an interesting fact. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but did you know that as a human, you need your five senses to gain information, to know anything? You, have, you can only gain information and knowledge through your five senses, yeah? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. There is no other way by which you gain information. But David here is saying, see what I said earlier, that God is wholly other. He is set apart from humanity. David is saying, even night, even the dark is light to you because God doesn't need the light to be able to see so that he can gain information. And like we are, like if you go to Shags, you know how when you go to Shags, it can be darkness that's tangible. You can touch the darkness around you. And so if you wake up to go to the, the, the loo at night, 
there's a likelihood you will hit things along the way because unless you see, you can't know that the table is there, right? Maybe someone can direct you and say, okay, turn left, turn right, do this. And then because of that sense of hearing, then you will be able to know what to do. But for so long as the five senses are limited, for you as a human, you will not be able to gain knowledge. But God is not limited by such things. God knows these things intricately, intrinsically, because he created all things, like I said earlier. The writer of Hebrews, and we'll read that text later, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing at all. Everything, he says, is uncovered and laid bare before God. Now, not only does God know everything and does not need He doesn't just know generally. He knows down to the last detail of things. Look at verse 1 to 6 of the same Psalm 139. David says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You know how before the thought has formulated nicely in your head, God has perceived it from a distance as it is coming to you so that you can be able to communicate it well. God has already perceived it. He says, you design my going out and my lying down. You know how when you're seated and you're wondering, okay, I'm a, I can go later. But okay, let me rise and go. All those things, God is, he knows when you will actually rise. He knows when you will actually go. He knows, he, he uh, designs your going out and your lying down. And David says, you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Do you imagine what it means for God to know a word completely? I mean, it's one thing to know a word because you can speak English or German or Swahili or whatever, but to know a word completely means to know the root of that word, to know what you, how that, that language works, the rules of that language. And when you use it, what you are trying to communicate by that word. As humans, you know, we, sometimes we, there is a, a mix-up in our communication because what you're trying to say you, maybe you have used the wrong English word for it, but you thought you had used the right one, and now you're wondering, why are you angry but me? And the person is saying, but did you, you didn't, and there's a, you know, we can, we can lack communication because we don't understand that language perfectly or how to use that word perfectly in a sentence. That is not trouble that God has. He understands that language. Not only that, God understands the perception you had of that issue so that you wanted to use that word to describe what it is you are trying to say. And so if another person misunderstands what you are trying to say because of their own bias and perception, God doesn't. He knows exactly what you're trying to say, which is why the Bible says that he knows that word completely before it is on your tongue. David goes on to say, you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. David here is acknowledging that we cannot be omniscient the way God is. You know, I have a friend of mine who once, a long time ago, he said, I don't know if I, uh, he remembers this, if I, if I told him about it, he said, you know, if someone is stabbed to death, God knows how many cells that knife went through to cause that death to happen. Maybe if it hadn't gone that far, it, it wouldn't have led to death. Or maybe if the amount of blood to the last pint how much drops so that that person, do you understand that kind of knowledge? That is what David is trying to describe, right? Not only does, not, does God know, not only does he know without needing our senses to gain information, and not only does he know intimately, but David also makes the case that God knows all potential events that could have happened, which are not the ones that you have experienced up to this point. Look at verse seven to 10. David says, where can I go from your flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. He, you see, he uses the word if. Perchance, were that to happen, even there, God would be there, omnipresent, and not only would he be there, his hand would guide him and hold him fast. 
He knows because he is everywhere, across all space and dimensions and all these things that could ever exist. God knows even potential events, even though they are not the ones that have happened. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. In Matthew 11, verse 21, let me start from verse 20. Jesus is speaking, well, it says, Jesus, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. He said, what to you, Chorazin? What to you, Bethsaida? For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. God, you know, here Jesus is speaking. He's talking about things that happened a long time ago. And he says, if the things that were done for them, because those ones went into destruction, miracles were not done there. But he says, if what I have done here could have been done for them, what would have happened is that they would have repented. So he is aware of not only what events have transpired or what will transpire, but also what could have transpired. Because of this ultimate, complete, and comprehensive knowledge, therefore, we call God all-wise. God is all-wise because of the amount of knowledge, the kind of knowledge that he has. And Paul references him like that in Romans chapter 16, verse 27. He says, to the only wise God, be glory. In fact, let's read that because I want you to see the context. In which Paul says that that's Romans chapter 16. The very, very last chapter, very last verses of Romans chapter, of, of Romans. So let me start from verse 25, Romans 16, 25. Paul says, now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles, you and I, Gentiles, might come to the obedience that come from faith. And then in, it's like Paul, in thinking about how this eternal God has caused this salvation to come even to us Gentiles. He says, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. The realization of all that God has done to bring you, child of God here, to belong to God, to have received the gift of salvation, the realization of that makes Paul says, to the only wise God. That kind of knowledge that he has described that covers from the past up to this point that he is writing. The wisdom of God that comes from the complete, utter, comprehensive knowledge of God, causes him to know the best possible solution for every problem that you can face, that you might ever have faced, that you will ever face in the future. In fact, in that same Romans, let's read now from, from chapter eight. This is a very familiar text of scripture for you, I know. Romans chapter eight, verse 28. Maybe you can even just recite it. Can you? Yes, I can see in a scary side. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. Paul says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God worked things out for the people who he loved and called according to his will. He worked things, everything out for their good. Now, I know probably at, up to this point you have thought the good is what you have determined is good. If you have thought about a situation and determined, I think this is what will be good for me, or this is what could have been good for me, even though things didn't work out that way. But if I was asked, Things should have taken this kind of turn. And so you think you know what could have been good for you. Paul here says, the good that God is working out for those who he loves and those he has called according to his purpose is this, that they should be conformed into the image of his son. And so through your life, remember David has made a case for, I am known 
intimately from when I was knit together in my mother's womb. From before my formed body was formed. God saw my body before it was unformed. I, before it was formed. I don't even know what exactly that means, but it is true. So he, uh, David has made a case for that. And you, God knew you like that, even before you knew God, before the day you gave your life to Christ and became part of the family of God. And he worked through both your choices and beyond your choices to bring you to the point where you are being conformed to the image and likeness of his son. Yeah? So that all the events that have transpired in your life have been ordained by the all-knowing God to bring you to the point where you are. Where the good he is seeking is that you should be conformed to the image of his son. Because why? God is interested in your eternity more than anything else. God is interested that you will be in heaven. The day you will close your eyes here, you will open them where? In heaven. And so this is the good that God is seeking and he works through your choices, both good and bad, and beyond your choices to bring about that good end, right? Now, the question before us then is, what do all these things mean for us? What is the, so what? Now that God is all knowing, what does that mean for me? I have four application points for you, but I want to open this up to you. When you go to your real groups this week, I want you to, to, you know, I, I said in the first service, and I mean it, so I want to say it again. I think I'm in one of the best real groups in this church. Because my real group, <laughs> we can leave real group at like 1 a.m. Because we are getting into the, the details of what it is we learned that previous Sunday. I see most of them in the second service because they get a chance to sleep in as I come here to preach the word of God to them. Uh, and then they go to argue with me later in the, <laughs> in the real group. Now, it... When you go to your real groups, open up that space for yourself. I'll, I'll only give four. You go and consider together what does the omniscience of God mean for us. My first application point is this. God's knowledge of us is a knowledge that is, I really looked forward for this, care-filled knowledge. It is a knowledge that is filled with care. I'll try to describe that. Look at verse, same one, Psalm 139. Uh, Verse 13. Verse 13 to 18. David said, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. David here is making a case for that God's knowledge is not detached from us. It is a knowledge that is filled with care. He was there when you were being formed. He was determining how the veins and the arteries and the cat capillaries, I only said caterpillar, God in heaven. <laughs> The capillaries are woven together. The type of blood that you will have, all these things. It is, it is a careful kind of involvement of your life before anyone ever met you. Yeah? It, it is a knowledge that is filled with care for you, not detached. Let me use an example of a kind of knowledge that can be detached so that you can understand that God is not like that. This is like the parable of the unjust judge. Jesus uses the parable of the unjust judge to end up saying God is not like that. Have you ever been on a, on a line? You're making a line to go to, to a government office. And you know how you arrive early, Huduma Center, Pale, because here you don't know when the service might come at 2 p.m. even though you arrived at 6 a.m. in the morning. So umeshafika uko pale kwa line, pale kwa KBS, you're making the line. Maybe you're looking for a passport, yeah? So that you can travel somewhere outside of the country. And as far as you know, maybe what they need is your ID, after you've done photocopies, colored photocopies in case they say they're not seeing you well. <laughs> you know, with the photo that you have put your hair back so that they see, your <laughs> you know? Uh, maybe you've thought even your results can determine whether you can be given a chance to go, you know you've, ca you've carried a few documents. And you make the line, you make the line, you arrive at the desk of the government official, and they say, I would put on a birth certificate, we may go and make another appointment. Now, Kumbe, it turns out, the person who was standing be behind you, 
once you have been kicked out of the line, will present his papers or her papers, and she's fine. She's told, come back after three months for your passport. I don't know how long it takes. Now, I don't know if you've ever been that person on the line, or the one who was standing behind, the one who did not have all the documents. And you could see, who you now na kipitia pitia ko confirm. You know how you keep opening the brown envelope just to make sure you have everything you need. And you can see they don't have a bad certificate. But you, while you know, because you, you went online, you know when you go to book the appointment, you saw everything that was needed and you carried everything. You know they don't have it, but now you, you are you the one who will tap someone and say, but they have jabeba bad certificate. <laughs> who told you? Why are you looking at my things? You know what I mean? And so it's a knowledge that can be detached. So you, are, you know this person will make this line for two hours, and at the end of that line will be told, go and bring your birth, your original. Oh, mommy, I'm a photocopy. But the government wants your original birth certificate. Do you understand that? Or when you arrive at the government official, and they can help, they know what you need so that you can be helped. Maybe you're registering for a business. I don't know what it is you're doing. But they say, ah, unajua uko kulisha fungwa satisa, we kuja kesho. They know what they can do for you to help you, but they are detached from their wanting to care for you. God is not like that. His knowledge is a care-filled knowledge. Now, what does that, what, how should that make you respond? David says in verse, um, verse 14, as, as he is, you know, pondering upon, as it is sinking in his heart, this care that God has in his extreme knowledge of him, he says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I do hope that that, as you ponder upon the knowledge of God, the extreme knowledge that God has of you, the complete knowledge that God has of you, and the care that comes along with that knowledge, that what you will respond with is praise. You know that song that says, my response is hallelujah. You know that song? It's, it's a, what can I say now that I know these things? One of the application points is that you will respond to God with praise as you think upon his utter knowledge of you. In fact, let me just mention, this is in Mark chapter 7, verse 37. The people, Jesus did a miracle, and the people, they talked with each other and said, he, he does all things well. I don't know if you've ever read that scripture. Find it in your real group, in your time. Mark 7, 37. It is, a, it is an awareness of my God. All these things you know, and all these things you have done because of your knowledge. Truly, you have done all things well. Application point two. God's thorough and complete knowledge of you should lead you to be open with God in sharing your thoughts, your fears, your worries, your struggles, and your sin. Yeah? Why? Because God already knows. He already knows that you're seated here worried about what you're going to do about a particular thing, a presentation, or a business that you need, or provision, or your parenting, or your child, or someone in hospital. He knows all these things because he knows you. Now, you come to him because he already knows, and in prayer, what God does is that he's, he's, he's drawing you out. As you're praying, you're expressing these things. God is drawing those things from your heart so that you can, you can put off the burden from off of your shoulders as you hand it over to him, as you lay it at the foot of the cross. Share those things with God. Come with confidence to God because you don't need to start describing how you arrived at the situation that you're in now. He already knows. He just wants to unburden you off of that care. Now, let me talk to you who is burdened by sin. There is a habitual sin you are perpetually in. You are trying so hard to walk out of. You have done all there is to be done as far as you know. <clears throat> but here you are, afraid of God, maybe not knowing whether you should be here or not. Maybe the thunder of God will strike if you try to raise your hands in worship. Afraid of God, you want to run away from God. Maybe even, you have even left for a while. Maybe you're just trying to make your way back. But you have this sin that is burdening you and is making you feel like you're distant from God and that you can't come to God. You, you can't come to God the way Pastor Nani can come. You know Pastor Nani, the way you think you know, doesn't have sin. <laughs> Let me talk to you and tell you this. You see, God already knows your sin. He knows not just that you did it, but as you started to figure it out in your mind, as, you, as the desire started to grow in your stomach, he knew it. He knew how you planned it out and arrived at that end. Uh, there's this story that is told of a, a, a worker in someone's home 
who, for whatever reason, I don't know if he was hungry or whatever, took one of the master's chickens and slaughtered it and killed it. I, I mean, it ate it. And he thought no one had seen him, but it turned out one of the other workers had seen him. And because of that, that other worker kept, you know, guilt tripping him. If you don't do this for me, takusema. You know? And, that, and because you, that, that guy was very afraid that he would lose his job, he, he would give in to the, to the demands, to, the, he would have, to the, that person, to the bribing. He was bribed out, given this, did this for that person, do, this for, do my work for me, all those things. And for a long time, that's how his life was like. And then someday he said, ah, but you know me, I can't live like this anymore. Let me just go and confess my sin so that this person will stop torturing me because of what I have done. And so he went to the master and confessed his sin. And his boss said, yeah, but I, you know, I know, I saw you. I was in, a, in an up, room upstairs, and I saw you taking that chicken and doing what you did. I was just waiting for the day you would come and tell me that that's what you had done. And this is, that's what I'm trying to describe when I say, come to God with that sin, stop, stop running. When you sin, you don't run away from God, you run to God so that you can be forgiven. That is where you find forgiveness. Maybe if you run from God, it is that question I asked earlier. Maybe you don't think God is a forgiving God. And you think you might find forgiveness elsewhere, maybe to the person who you sinned against, maybe all these other places apart from God. Look at what 1 John chapter 3, verse 19 says. 1 John 3, verse 19 and 20. John says, this is how we know we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. It's a very interesting text of scripture. He says, this is how you know you belong to the truth because sometimes that habitual sin makes you even begin to wonder, am I really born again? Because if I was, maybe I wouldn't be prone to this sin like this. Maybe I wouldn't be falling again and again in this sin. Maybe I need to give my life to Christ afresh. But John says here, this is how you know you belong to the truth and to how you set your heart at rest in his presence. And he says, if your heart condemns you, and the reason I'm talking about this sin is because your sin is condemning you, your heart is condemning you because of that sin. If your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart, and he knows everything. What does that even mean? It means God knows what it is in your background, what it is in the things that you, the things that have happened in your life, in your trauma, whatever, that has led you, that has caused you to be a person who is prone to this particular sin. He knows everything. He is greater than your heart. So what you need to do is come to the one who knows you in comprehensiveness like that, that you might find release for your soul. I also want to talk to you who is burdened by guilt, even though you have already confessed it to God. You have already come again and again and said, God, I'm really sorry. I, I really shouldn't have killed that person. Let's assume you have been a hitman before. <laughs> but hopefully not now. Uh, hopefully that's not your trade. That's not how we receive your tithe. It, <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you have asked for forgiveness, but you're carrying that burden of guilt. Again to you, I say, if your heart is condemning you and you have already confessed your sin to God, God is greater than your heart. And he knows that thing. And he already dealt with it on the cross. If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. And he forgives it in, in completeness. You know, the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin away from us. Right, application point number three. His deep, God's deep and intimate knowledge of you should serve to give you a sense of accountability. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, like I referenced earlier. Let's read it now. Hebrews 4 13. Let me start from verse 12. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Then verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You can hide your sin for, from everyone. You can lie to everyone about what you did, and people might even believe you about it. 
but you cannot lie to God because everything about you, like I said, from the beginning of your thought process to arrive at the end of that action, everything is uncovered and laid bare before God. And why is it important to be accountable before God? Because it says, before the eyes of him to whom we must, the word is must, give account. The bar is raised for us believers. In fact, for the whole world, because judge will, God will judge the whole world. The bar is raised. Be accountable to God. Even if you can lie and hide from everyone else, you can never lie to God. You can fail to confess your sin to man, or you can, or you can, or you can even confess, and there's nothing they can do, you know, because in the end, someday you come to discover, but they, I, humans are not to be feared that much, actually. There's nothing they can actually do about this thing that I have done. No one will have the courage to say, you, you know you are a hitman. Can you? No one can. In the end, humans can't do anything. The one who can judge. In fact, Jesus said, don't be afraid of the one who can kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can kill your body and throw your soul into hell. Maybe this is for you if you have never given your life to Christ. If you are here, you are an unbeliever, you have never thought the cross has any value for you, that the blood of Jesus was shed for, what is that? Maybe it's even a, a, a fairy tale for you. When you stand before the throne of God to give an account for yourself, you will know it would have been important for you to already have come to God from the beginning. So come, you who is an unbeliever, and come, you who is a believer, but you need to stop lying to God, to yourself that you're lying to God. And lastly, number four, if we accept, this is a call to action for you. If we accept that God knows everything and that he is all wise, child of God, should you not read the scriptures a little bit more? Should you not come to that knowledge, all that you need, the Bible says, for life and godliness is found in the scriptures. Shouldn't you come a little bit more if you really truly believe that God is omniscient? So my call to you is this. Let me read, let me, James chapter 1 verse 5. These are two scriptures I will read about this as I come to a close. James chapter 1 verse 5. I was going to say the book of James has disappeared from my Bible. James chapter 1, verse 5. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. The wisdom of God is in the, is in the scriptures that God has written. If you lack wisdom, you remember how Solomon asked God for wisdom and it was given to him in extreme measures. You come to God, and James says this, that he gives generously, maybe even more than you are asking for, and he gives without finding fault. You know how sometimes you go to people to ask something and they say, honestly, like in a real group, you might be unable to ask your question because while your theologians, they cannot allow you to ask your question. If you ask God, it will be given to you without finding fault. And in Psalm chapter 19, verse 7, David said, Psalm 19, 7, the law of God, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. That is the same case. Those of us who are simple, among the wise or among the simple. But if you consider yourself in need of wisdom, keep coming here. Don't, every other thing you're looking for cannot serve what you need as much as the scriptures can serve what you need. Come to the scriptures for life and for godliness. If you really truly consider God to be all knowing and all wise, we need to come to the scriptures a little bit more. So this is a call to action for you. As I finish, let me say this quote. Let me give this quote that if you've had the pleasure of being emailed by Pastor David, you have seen in your email before. This is what, it is a, it is a quote by C.H. Spurgeon. He says, I'm trying to look for it. Oh, here it is. He says, meditate on the exceeding greatness and faithfulness of divine love this evening and so go to thy bed in peace. And I want to use it to say, meditate on the omniscience of God this week. 
also go, go to your bed in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.